Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Museum of the City of New York. My name is Whitney Donhauser, and I am the director and president here of the museum. So thank you so much for joining us for Do Monuments Matter? Reimagining their world in a changing world, their role in a changing world. So we are honored tonight to present this program in partnership with the World Monuments Fund um, as their 2020 Paul Mellon Lecture. Tonight's conversation will explore the role of monuments in contemporary society, as well as the role that communities play in decision making about monuments. So for the Museum of the City of New York, this conversation could not be more timely. Um, as some of you may know, in April 2018, the J. Marion Sims statue right across the street from us at Fifth Avenue and 103rd Street was removed following years of community advocacy. On October 5th, 2019, Right here in this very room, the proposals of four artists were presented at a public symposium as part of the selection process for new work to replace the monument. Ultimately, the artist Vinnie Bagwell's design, Victory, came forward to replace his hymn statue. Tonight's panel will explore the story in far greater depth, but of course, I really need to emphasize that while the program was conceived, was not conceived as a sequel to the October event when the World Monuments Fund invited the museum to co-present their Mellon Lecture on the question of monuments today, we were pleased to serve again as a forum for continuing discussion and debate about the core, the matters of core importance to our identity and self-representation as New Yorkers. So we are thrilled tonight to have Vinnie Bagwell with us, as well as other speakers. So we, Vinnie will be joined by Mark Jarosmek, who is a professor of history and theory at the, of architecture at MIT, as well as Jenny Moore, who's the executive director of the Chinati Foundation, um, for a conversation moderated by the professor Erica Avrami of Columbia University's Graduate School for Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. So I hope you all saw on your places um, were note cards on your chairs um, for you to write any questions that you have. And the st museum staff who are placed around the room will come around halfway through the conversation to collect those questions. I do have to warn you that um, given our time constraints, we will not be able to select all of those questions, but we'll just gather a handful of them and I thank you for in, in, thank you in advance for understanding that we won't be able to get through everyone. So tonight, what's amazing is that we have a completely sold out program. So I don't think there's any um, sort of spillover, but if you, there's an empty seat or chair, I think we're fine. It looks like it's we're okay. Um, Anyway, uh, we do have an overflow room, which is fantastic to have so many people come out for this important matter. So now I'd like to introduce Benedict de Montlore, who is the CEO of the World Monuments Fund, the world's foremost private organization dedicated to saving extraordinary places while empowering the communities around them. She is responsible for di defining WMF's strategic vision um, currently implementing that vision in more than 30 countries around the world and leading a team that spans the globe. Her background mixes culture and art, politics, international diplomacy, and human rights. And prior to joining WMF, she spent two decades working across three continents as a senior diplomat at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I will now hand it over to Benedict. Thank you. Thank you very much, Whitney, and thank you for welcoming us uh, here tonight at the Museum of the City of New York. It's a beautiful building, and I cannot think of a more fitting place to welcome our annual lecture. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight, and especially our board chair, Lorna Goodman, without whom this event would not have been possible because she's not only the chair of the board of WMF, but she's a trustee here, so she made this marriage. I want also uh, to thank all our trustees who are here, as well as our members and supporters. So, and 
Of course, I want also to take a moment to thank the estate of Paul Mellon, which has made uh, tonight's possible, thanks to the Paul Mellon Fund for Educational Program, which is so crucial to us and really a huge part of our mission, because not only we preserve monuments, but we try to create a culture of uh, cultural heritage preservation. And this wouldn't be possible without this endowment, and we are really honored that Fred Terry uh, is here with us tonight. So, it may seem paradoxical that World Monuments Fund has an event called Do Monuments Matter? In fact, one of our trustees told me, Benedict, what a weird question. Like, you're the head of World Monuments Fund. You should have the answer to that. And um, it's true. Over the last 55 years, we've run projects, um, more than 600 projects, all over the world, working with partners to preserve their cultural heritage. I've joined World Monuments Fund in October, and I've traveled quite a lot to discover our project. Um, I went in Cambodia, in Thailand, in Burma, and everywhere I was in awe of the amazing monuments that we are preserving. I was in awe of the incredible training programs that we've created with skilled masters to create this new generation who is going to preserve this cultural heritage. And I was so impressed by the communities all around the world that devote so much time and energy to preserve their cherished sites and monuments. So yes, of course, monuments matter. Yes but we should take care of them. But what is difficult, what is, difficult is to articulate why they matter. Um, a bit less, a bit more than a year ago, we were all watching a Notre Dame's cathedral in flames. And I think all of us felt a deep sadness. And, but at the same time, I think we all felt that it was difficult to articulate in words why it was a tragedy. So that's why we thought, oh, what a wonderful occasion. We have this Paul Mellon lecture. So let's invite the people who, through their work, have been confronted with the significance of monuments and are going to be able to tell us better than anyone else why it matters. So I'm really happy that all our speakers tonight have accepted uh, our invitation. Um, I'm excited to introduce Erika Avrami, who is our pro moderator. So she's the James Marston Fitch Ad Assistant Professor of Historic Preservation at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, and an affiliate with the Earth Institute. Um, it's a very long thing. Her research focuses on the intersection of heritage and sustainability planning, the role of preservation in urban policy and societal values and spatial justice issues in heritage decision making. She was formerly a project specialist at the Getty Conversation Institute. She served as a trustee and secretary of US ECOMOS. And most importantly, she was a director of research and education at World Monuments Fund. So thank you, Erica, and she will introduce the other speakers. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you, World Monuments Fund. Thank you, Museum of the City of New York. And especially thank all of you for joining us this evening for what we hope will be a very uh, intriguing and lively dialogue. I have the honor of introducing our three distinguished panelists this evening, who each bring a unique perspective to the question, do monuments matter? One is an architectural historian and theorist. One is an institutional director and curator and one is an artist. Through varying processes of research, curation, management, community engagement, and creative expression, they help to shape the spatial contours of history in the landscape and reimagine the concept of monuments. I'd like to invite our speakers, our panelists, to join me. Mark Karzenbeck is professor of the history and theory of architecture at MIT. He works on a wide range of topics, both historical and theoretical, and is one of the country's leading advocates for global history. 
He has published several books and articles on that topic, including the groundbreaking co-authored textbook, A Global History of Architecture. He also works on philosophy in the digital age and as a critic and a curator. He is known for his edX lectures on architectural history that have thousands of participants worldwide. Jenny Moore is the director of the Chinati Foundation, a contemporary art museum founded by Donald Judd in Marfa, Texas. Comprised of 34 buildings and 340 acres, Chinati is one of the most significant installations of contemporary art in the world. In her six-year tenure, Moore has overseen completion of Robert Irwin's untitled Dawn to Dusk, completed Chinati's first master plan, and stewarded a 30% increase in vis visitorship annually. Moore has over 20 years of experience in contemporary art, including holding curatorial positions at the New <coughs> Museum, Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, and the 8th Guangzhou Biennial. Vinnie Bagwell, an alumna of Morgan State University, began sculpting in 1993. Her first public artwork, the first lady of jazz, Ella Fitzgerald, at Yonkers Metro North Amtrak train station, is the first sculpture of a contemporary African-American woman to be commissioned by a, a municipality in the United States. She has won 20 public art. <laughs> she has won 20 public art commissions around the US. And presently, Vinnie Bagwell is creating the Enslaved Africans Rain Garden, an urban heritage public art project for Yonkers, a seven-foot Sojourner Truth for the walk over the Hudson in Poughkeepsie, and the $1 million Victory Beyond Sims for Central Park. Please join me in welcoming the speakers. So to launch the dialogue this evening, we have asked each of the panelists to prepare some introductory <coughs> remarks about their work and about how they see monuments evolving as dynamic elements of the social and physical fabric of communities. So for those of you who are familiar with the term speed dating, this is, these are speed remarks uh, because we've asked them to, to keep them really quick just to provoke our conversation and give you some, some visuals to help us get going in our dialogue. So I'll invite Mark to join us first. Before us. There we go. Revolves around, of course, what is a monument? It sounds like a straightforward question. But I hope that what we can at least begin agreeing on is that the question cannot be answered, certainly tonight or in any other time, in any straightforward way. To avoid problems, we should at least understand that the word monument needs to be have an adjective at, in front of it. So a world monument is different from a national monument, is different from a civic monument, is different from a cultural monument, is different from a war monument, and so forth down the line. In Germany, they have things called counter monuments <laughs> uh, that were created in the 1980s when they wanted to rethink attitudes uh, toward the Holocaust. We have few examples of these in the United States, uh, but I wish we in had more. Now in my field of architecture, monuments, uh, the discussion about monuments, has to a large part been associated uh, with very large scale important buildings. And on the, uh, if we can go back, I mean, you can sort of see some of those uh, here on this uh, slide advertising this event. So many of these buildings have been captured, of course, by the UNESCO monument list, which has in its uh, embrace uh, thousands of celebrated buildings, so many that when I teach my survey course in the history of architecture, practically they're all UNESCO monuments, so I have to really look hard for ones that are not. But after all, what is India without the Taj Mahal? What is Cambodia without Angkor Wat? And Egypt, of course, without uh, the pyramids. <clears throat> but this monumentification, which is designed in the context of what UNESCO called universal values, is really a real good sort of say a relatively recent thing. Certainly the buildings are old, but the list of specialty items in that list comes from the 1970s as the consequence of the shock that came out of World War II. There are about 1,100 buildings on that list. But, if I may say, the list is in trouble. After all, there are only so many buildings in the world. 
and pretty soon we're going to run out. And I would say, we're done. <clears throat> or at least we're sort of flatlining. Now, one critic has argued that we have gone so far that everything now has become a monument or a memorial or saturated with memory, and that we have too many of these things. But I disagree. <clears throat> Despite the fact of the unification of the top end of, the memo of monuments, mostly frozen in time, there's a vast range of possible experimentation. In fact, we have not even begun to understand how we as a public would like to think about memory, participation, and value. What things in the past do we want to place within our public sphere? What are we seeing in the South around the Confederate monuments might be the beginning of the emergence of a new kind of conversation, a new sensibility. I do hope so. For it speaks to the fact that we are not in a democracy where hegemonic or abstract rules uh, apply. <clears throat> but that we are in a democracy where there are many layers of cultural reality, many layers of history, many layers of people who want to be heard and whose contributions are meaningful. The breakdown of hegemonies might mean a richer conversation about shared pasts, but it also means that there are now more players at the table, more alternative views, more potential for contestations and the like. But we have to embrace that messy possibility and trust that knowing more about our history is better than knowing less. So in that spirit, <clears throat> I would like to suggest the opposite of the macro uh, monuments uh, that are uh, talked about in the UNESCO framework and talk about mini monuments or micro monuments. Monuments did not speak to the grand narratives, um, but can add a very important human dimension to socially rich experience of the world and our place in it. We have become, I think, idly adverse to such things in the United States. We used to paint our cars with flowers and the like. Now, uh, no one ever dreams of it. I would ruin my house if I, you know, touched it up in funny ways. The resale value would go down, and I'm, I'm constrained by preservation codes. So the only place where we can see the richness of who we are is in art, and, of course, in the textual-based constructions. Architecture is a different matter altogether. So I would like to see a proliferation of small, local monuments uh, far away from the urgencies of UNESCO and the like. So they can, of course, point to small, heroic events or even to other ways to remember the past and future. But I love the field of corn, the six foot tall corn cobs created by Malcolm Cochran as a tribute to the town's agrarian legacy. And I also like the community effort that resulted in the external facade of the garage of Kansas City Public Library. The first architect wanted to make something quite abstract, but the community resisted and asked for real books. <laughs> And the new architects, which were a dimensional innovation, designed it um, around that, precisely that, asking the Kansas residents uh, to pick the titles uh, of the books. I also love uh, Fork in the Road, which, <laughs> which started as a joke <laughs> uh, by local residents, Bob Stain and Ken Marshall, and turned, uh, and turned into a Pasadena uh, landmark. The fork is often the site of food drives and charitable events and other events of the local community. Now, I admit that such littleness might not be everyone's taste, but my main point is not the aesthetic of it all, even though I do like it personally, but rather the question of narrative. How do we tell stories in the overlapping realm of visuality and public space? I fear that in our cities and culture, we have a pronounced narrative deficiency, like a vitamin deficiency. We need more narrative vitamins. So instead of telling stories, we often make pronouncements. So let me conclude by showing this photo that I found uh, among a uh, website of nature walkers. And the person who found this in the woods asked, <clears throat> who is this young man? Was this one of his favorite spots in the pines? Do his family and friends still visit? How did he pass? Will someone do this for me someday? Now these are really, really great questions as they help us want to know more about the relationship between place, a real person, and a real story. I can imagine a city filled with these things, walls, street corners, fences, posts, sides of houses, filled with signs of our presence and our pasts. Some new, some old, some very fresh, and some long forgotten. Think past the negatives that we might associate with the clutter. But when I walk down the street, I see how architects and city planners have consistently purged our spatial world of the informatics of the signs of life, dulling our sensitivity to the world beyond. So I would think maybe a good dose of messy realism is what we should aim for. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. 
Um, I'm going to talk about a place that's very far from here, Marfa, Texas, uh, 12 hours by uh, planes, trains, and automobiles, basically. And what I'm going to talk about is the Chinati Foundation, which is a place that in 2013 the World Monuments Fund put on their watch list. So we are a contemporary art museum founded by the artist Donald Judd in Marfa, Texas, which is three hours from the closest airport and 60 miles from the border. This is what Marfa looked like in the 1930s. And this is what it looks like today. So not much has changed in Marfa, Texas. And we are a museum created by an artist for artists. Donald Judd left this place, which many of you might be familiar with, 101 Spring Street downtown, which some might say is a monument, because it was a five-story building in Soho was not enough space for Donald Judd. So he came after, he, after working through ideas about the permanent installation of art. For Judd, it was important that the time and care and consideration that went into the experience of the work and not just the making of the work, that was significant. And the cycle of temporary exhibitions and moving work around in the world wasn't good for the art and it certainly wasn't good for the artist's ideas. So he came to Far West Texas. And with the support of the Dia Art Foundation, he bought this, which is Fort D.A. Russell. This was a former military base, served through both world wars, was decommissioned after the Second World War, and this is a historical image of Fort D.A. Russell, and this is a contemporary image of the Chinati Foundation. Here, Judd could work on a scale that was unprecedented. This is one of the first works he installed here, 15 works in concrete. This is an outdoor sculpture that covers a kilometer in length. Space was something he needed, and he thought all artists should have, for him, particularly for sculpture, in order to make space, and he meant sculpturally, you needed to have space. He also transformed buildings architecturally. These were historic buildings. These particular buildings, the artillery sheds, um, house his 100 works in mill aluminum. Here, Judd had the chance to transform what were very common artillery sheds. They housed the artillery and the mechanized vehicle for the military into spaces filled with light and form to house these sculptures, which have been placed once and never moved. The permanent installation of art, the commitment to something that should endure through time and space. <laughs> these are not climate controlled spaces. All the conventions you know about museums, climate controlled, hermetically sealed, white walls, doesn't apply out here. If you look closely, you might, you might see death trails of spiders on these sculptures because they live in this incredible desert environment. For Judd, there should be no separation between art and life. You can start to see what these buildings do to bring these works, very not minimal works, alive in space and light and time. What's interesting here is the relationship between the art, architecture, and the land that defies all conventions for most museums, if you think about them. But this is what the World Monument Fund recognized worth preserving. There are places that Judd wrote about somewhere a portion of the best art of this time and space must exist as an ideal of what the artists wanted it to be. And it's a permanent installation, and it requires stewardship and a commitment to a very long-term life out in a very extraordinary environment. But what's notable about that also is Judd didn't just extend that um, generosity and permanence to his own work. He invited other artists to have a place here. This was a former wool and mohair warehouse that he transformed into a permanent installation for the work of John Chamberlain. These were the barracks buildings for the military. Oh, I'm already out of time. <laughs> wow, is that it? Okay, okay, well, okay. Dan Flavin, I'm gonna click through this very quickly. A Monument to the Last Horse by Klaus Oldenburg. Um, that's Judd and Klaus Oldenburg. And I will say that this is also a living space. This comes forward in time. As much as permanence is a commitment to stewardship, we have artists who come and work on their terms in relationship to these places. So I'll say when I think about monuments, I think we often think about these conventions of objects on pedestals that are fixed about a particular point in history. But this is also a monument to an artist's vision, to what it means to travel to a place and see their ideal experience of their work and give that opportunity to other artists moving forward in time. So what I'm excited to think about tonight, what does duration mean in terms of a commitment to something that we value enough to call it a monument. Good evening. 
Hi, I'm Vinnie Bagwell. Ha, there I am. All right, so I'm a storyteller. And uh, one of the first things I noticed when I first started sculpting was that I did not see monuments to people of color. I saw dead presidents and war heroes. I did not see anything about women or black people or artists or anything. And that's one of the things that got me going. And so I became what I call a steward of our nation's memory. This is the piano lesson that was at the Signature Theater. That's my piano over there on the left. And so uh, I began creating public art that conveys the unvarnished truth. This is Frederick Douglass at Hofstra University. And the idea was to share the history that elevates the culture of marginalized people. This sculpture is uh, Legacy, it's in Memphis, and it was designed to celebrate the memory of African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Native Americans, and the budget wasn't very big, so this is kind of how I really began using bar relief as a narrative to extend the story. And so my style is anchored in naturalism. I went, I didn't go to art school. My daughter says that I say realism. She says, Mom, it's naturalism. And it's divined by candid portraiture. This is Ella Fitzgerald at the Yonkers Metro North train station. Um, this is my first public art project. Um, because we didn't have Google back then, uh, I didn't know how to find a call, so I created my own. And so uh, one of the things that's really a keystone to my uh, practice is I like to expose students. Uh, these are fifth graders from the Hawthorne Pearl School. And we talk about things like intuition and the voices in our heads. Um, I don't teach technique. You can go to school for that. Um, I, I want to talk about the process that nobody talks about, which is, again, related to how do you plug into the force? How do you get it to come through you? How do you know it's coming through you? So we have these very kind of interesting conversations, and they're very responsive to it because nobody talks like that. And so my goal is to design truly memorable places. Uh, 11 years ago, I decided to create a public art project to celebrate enslaved Africans. I Googled and realized that there are no major monuments in this country to celebrate them as a group. Of course, here in New York, we have the African burial ground, but that's not really the same thing. And so uh, I began developing because I'm a writer. Uh, it's one of the other things that I do. Uh, I became a grant writer and began developing uh, the funding to create five life-size people in a really, really lush garden. And um, right now we're waiting for the county of Westchester and the city of Yonkers to get through the easements, and hopefully uh, it will be completed this fall. Victory uh, is designed to replace the J. Marion Sims sculpture. It's not about religion. It's really more about the spirit. Um, because the Museum of New York is across the street, and because the hospital's across the street, and because the uh, Vanderbilt Garden Gate is up the street, um, I took all of these things and tried to incorporate it to make this sculpture look like it's been here all the time. And so this is the basic design for that. Uh, as usual, she's got all of this bas-relief sculpture on the bottom of the skirt. And basically, that's to represent women in general. Um, in the last couple of years, I've been asked to speak at a few things. And a couple of years ago, uh, now I guess about two years ago, um, I was invited to speak up at Yale University for a environmental justice symposium. And I decided to attend the whole thing because I really didn't understand why they were asking me to speak. And I learned a lot about what this country has done to women. Like, I was shocked. I didn't know that we had sterilized 40,000 Puerto Rican women back in the 40s. And I learned a whole lot of stuff. And so this monument is to women in general, just not the 12 that J. Marion Sims um, experimented on, but all of the women who have been subjected to different variations of abuse 
over the, I'm just gonna say the century. Um, again, the gate in the background is designed to mimic the uh, gate at the entrance to the Conservancy Gardens. And again, I asked the architect to give me something more feminine. The red tree in the back is a plum tree. It blooms pink uh, in the spring and it's blood red during the year and the idea is to remind people of the sacrifice that women have made. This is the night view. And so again, uh, I did something, I guess, unprecedented. I asked the city of New York, may I please have a footprint? And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, I need 30 by 30. I wanna do something, I wanna create a space. And so we're using granite pavers again to kind of create this idea of this sculpture brings enlightenment. And then of course, uh, they asked me, okay, what else? And I said, I, I want big wow nighttime. So there will be night lighting that comes out of the ground. And so uh, this is pretty much me. Thank you. So thank you, Mark, Jenny, and Vinny. Uh, to get us started, uh, given that we are here in the Museum of the City of New York, and it's the start of Women's History Month, so thank you for mentioning um, the role of women or the underrepresented role of women uh, within monuments. I would like to invoke a female pioneer in the field of architecture and urbanism and a noted New Yorker, Ada Louise Huxtable, who in her farewell to Penn Station in 1963 said, we will probably be judged not by the monuments we build, but by those we have destroyed. Contemporary debates have brought new knowledge and awareness to questions of what monuments to preserve or not. But the work that the three of you bring to our discussion underscores that this is not simply a binary dilemma of save or not save. The creative, the political, the community building processes that you highlight, um, it's a spectrum. And that monuments are always undergoing some form of transformation, whether through their form or materiality or in the ways that we as society value them and steward them. And to use the word that you brought up, Vinny, um, I would like to ask each of you to reflect on that question of stewardship. Um, and how you see monuments as a medium for storytelling through stewardship. Mark, you talked about narrative deficiency, um, the intersection of life and art, for example, in, in the context of the landscape um, in Marfa. And Vinny, certainly you spoke very poignantly about being that steward of history. So if you could each reflect on that for us. Good. Me first? Sure. Um, I genuinely believe that art in public places should re reflect the community's values. And so the fact that we are removing monuments uh, that no longer represent our views, like for instance, I'll just use New Orleans, for example, Baltimore, uh, where they took down their Civil War memorials. Uh, in New Orleans, they had to call in the National Guard. Um, but the idea is that um, we don't want to destroy the monuments, we just want to find a more appropriate place and then put art there that represents the values of the community. So this is why I do civic engagement, because I want to hear the voice of the community. Um, it's important to know what people care about. And so the idea is if you live somewhere and you've lived there for many years, you know the soul of the place. And the question is, how do you think that should be represented through art? And so there should always be this dialogue between the artist, the commissioner, and the community to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Um, and then also, too, I think that because many of our cities are, I'll just use the word gentrifying, they're evolving in terms of the populations, I think that it's important to preserve the history of place. And so again, you have to look to the community, first of all, to discover what they value. Like for instance, I'm from Yonkers, and we, we have Ella Fitzgerald, you know, who grew up there. Um, she's an international music icon, and you know, I said to the city of Yonkers, we have to celebrate her. Coincidentally, she died while I was working on it, but it was the whole idea that 
I thought to do this. Nobody had thought to do this before. And so uh, I think all over the country, particularly this year, because this year is the 100th anniversary, uh, a lot of cities are looking at who they value. So for instance, in San Francisco, you've got them doing Maya Angelou. You know, in other places, you have all of these uh, places that are doing local women. Like for instance, I'm a finalist in Boise, Idaho, where they're doing a local woman that, that you can't find when you Google, but she's valuable to them. And so I think it's important um, that we be mindful of preserving history of place because things are changing so much and when the new people show up, they think that, you know, hey, I just woke up like this and that's not true. You know, it's important to preserve the history um, because the history is valuable. Uh, I, I, it reminds me that besides who are monuments for, when are monuments for? Because when you had posed the question to me, I think of monuments being an homage to the past. And I think that's what we're grappling with because you've preserved something from the past that had value then, but that changes as it moves forward into time with both populations and culture and we learn other histories and we realize there are whole histories that never were monumentalized in the way we made decisions back then. And our response, or my responsibility in a place like this is there's so many layers of histories just architecturally in these buildings and then there's the responsibility to artists of a particular time and place and their ideas and their um, request to us, their demand to us to steward that, to preserve it. But nothing ever doesn't change. So even in permanence and preservation, it's so active. It's Stewardship is such an important um, responsibility, but it's also for the future. You're saving something for people who come later, but shouldn't they be allowed to have it on their terms too, to decide that it doesn't have value to them anymore? So we're in this constant flux of what are we valuing, what are we putting resources in, what are we preserving for whom and why and for what time? Um, yeah, I could build on that. I think, you know, the idea that uh, I mean, stewardship, of course, is important, but you have to always ask, well, how is it valued in, as you say? In other words, because many of the things that we're stewarding uh, valued a lot of things out, right? So 99% of the story is sort of not in, in, in these things. So how do we recapture these stories? How do we recapture and find, um, you know, the problem is what's the evidence for it? What's the, uh, you know, what's the, the mechanism by which we can recapture something which is gone, which is erased, right? Uh, through violence or inactivity or just sort of simply gone just because it never written down. So we're facing a sort of a weird philosophical question of taking something uh, and protecting sort of the dead bones of it, but yet the narrative part is sort of weirdly either aligned in the wrong way or completely gone, right? <clears throat> so stewardship is a philosophical project. I mean, this, I don't have to tell any of this to you guys. <laughs> to you guys, you deal with this every day. Uh, <clears throat> So, but at some level, it, be, it rises to the level of, of a philosophical project, right? Because we're dealing with something that is invisible, right? And that we want to re restore, right? So once, you know, we, are, we're, we sort of begin to see that, we begin to open up the, 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 this, the I don't know, the, this, the impermeableness, right? And sort of maybe we can invent stories. Maybe we can create things that haven't, you know, that what, this is what it would have been like, right? So it's almost a fictional accounts might be more important than sort of the hard factual evidence, which will only be bureaucratic worlds uh, because of whatever thing like that. So that's what I talk about. We need to sort of unleash a bit more narrative potential. Um, the question of architecture is, is, is the sort of the hard part in a way because artists maybe work already in the in this way, but you know buildings designed to not work in that way, um, and therefore stewardship becomes you know sort of. Uh, laden by the falsification of construction and so forth, and who knows who built this building here, right? Who knows what kind of labor went into it? I mean, as an architect, I, I can tell you something, but it's, it'll bore you to tears, right? But <clears throat> these are also stories uh, that we often forget, right? What kind of labor, what kind of activities, what kind of sourcing and so forth, right? The, the white oak here, uh, you know, that piece of white oak might be the very last oak from the uh, Ozarks, and probably doesn't come from the Ozarks, it probably came from Germany, uh, but the German white oak uh, was shipped to, it, it, I may have been working on this, you know, it's shipped to Indonesia for processing and then shipped to the United States because we don't have any more white oak. 
you know, these are also stories, right, where we're asking not just humans, so to speak, right, but what if that white oak could tell a story, right? It would be yeah. pretty shocking, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we need to open up. Mm -hmm. yep. You have your, did you want to say something else? or Because I, I want to I want to no, prod no, Mark I, on Well, the, the other thing that he, because he brought something to my mind is that, you know, one of the things that I am working on is making my public art interactive. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, for the urban heritage sculpture that I'm doing for Yonkers, I brought in an, an oral, a spoken word artist, mm -hmm. so that people can access the stories on their phones. So it's not just looking at like a bronze sculpture, you can actually hear more information, you know, by interacting with your phone to learn more. So I think that, you know, one of the interesting things about now with technology and whatnot is that you can be creative uh, with how you do your public art installations. So a story like that, I would be interested in that. I would be interested in knowing that. So again, there might be a way to create, you know, a way for people to access an app that would tell you the story of that. Oh, but again, you have to kind of think of what is valuable. What do people really care about knowing? Right, because we're presuming that monuments are built things right. of materials that have form, either for architecture or sculptural form, but there are other things that we see as monumental or of value that have story. I mean, you could go, I think that's what's a monument look like in 200 years. What form mm -hmm. does that take? Because we're all you know, bringing in technology. That opens up a whole other issue of just the impermanence of technology. I mean, we're so tied to the cycle of the next and the new through technology, we're losing important stories and things all the time because we're, we're, not, we're not preserving <laughs> that technology. That, that might be a different panel no, discussion. Well, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna challenge you three on this one. Okay. And, and not that I, I disagree, but to say, um, is there something about encounter and spatial encounter and um, while we do have a, a, a host of technologies that are, are now enabling us to tell stories in a different way, is there something about space and the ability to claim space, whether as a form of restorative justice, to be able to say there were people who occupied this land or people who had stories here, or whether it's through or as a form of community engagement that people understand that this place is theirs or that it it is part of or could be part of their identity. In what ways do you think claiming space is an important element in, in monuments and the ability to encounter? I would say that where Marfa is is incredibly important. So for the artists at Chinati, Judd couldn't do what he wanted to do here. And you have to make the journey to far west Texas which is no, for anyone who's made that journey, that's no small commitment, and it had to be on those terms. So it is all about going to that place. We're often asked, can't you put it in a room or do a pop-up or put it in a, it's hard enough to put it in a book. It was so important for that artist that you make that commitment to make that journey to a place that doesn't feel like any of this and you drive three hours through the desert going 100 miles an hour and you might see 10 other cars and you take one right-hand turn and you are in space in a way that you don't get in the density of a place like New York City, which he left because he didn't have space. So it's also the requirement on, on our part for people to make that journey to that space because it had such significance besides the light, the very distinct light and land of Far West Texas and the sense of possibility. I mean, we, Marfa, Texas is actually a frontier community that still exists. It's an economic classification that it's, it's how you calculate the density of resources. So there's so many other kinds of um, descriptions of space out there besides the fact that you have to go to that space and it requires that time and commitment to look and think about what you're seeing and what you made the journey to experience. Mm -hmm. I, um, I like site-specific public art projects. Uh, a good example would be in the District of Columbia, I was invited to apply for a public artwork for an elementary school and one of the things that they stated was that the Civil War Memorial wanted to use the public artwork on the outside of the school as part of their walking tour. And I was like, why? Like, why would you do that? So when I began to research the neighborhood, I discovered that it was 
at the turn of the century, it was a contraband camp. I'm like, what the heck is a contraband camp? So now I'm Googling and I discovered that because enslaved Africans were considered chattel property, the District of Columbia, when you hit the District of Columbia, you were free because they had already you know, abolished slavery. But now you become the property of the District of Columbia. So anybody that's pursuing you, it's like, no, they're ours now. And when I started talking to people about this history, nobody knew about contraband camps. You know? And what's interesting is that it didn't happen only in DC, it happened in a lot of places across America where they declared, this is, this is contraband camp. And when enslaves reach here, it's like leaving your cannon on the line. That's mine now. And I thought that was a really extraordinary piece of information. And so that's what I based my, my idea on. And, and I won on it. And they went on to say to me, we picked you because you went so deep into the history. You know, We didn't really expect you to do that. And I was like, well, it just kind of happened, you know, but it's the whole idea that the artwork that's on the outside of the school is relative to the history of that place. We're talking about a couple of hundred years ago, but it's still a good story and it's true. Uh, I came from Boston and I was standing in the Back Bay uh, train station. And I had seen these panels before and I had read them, but given the topic, I was you know, looking at them more uh, you know, ardently. And there are some very large and beautiful panels about the Pullman Incorporated and how they had hired uh, African Americans who had come to Boston, who had been recently freed slaves from the South. And there were this large community there in Boston of African American uh, people. And uh, he had hired them uh, for, to work um, on, the, on the trains and how for many of them this was their first access uh, to, to money and to stability and to sort of uh, you know, uh, uh, capacity to buy a house and rent and so forth like that. Right? And there are these sort of wonderful stories about that. There are four or five panels. They're all badly lit. You hardly ever see them, right? They're all on steel, on gray, on gray, on you know, whatever. Uh, but they're there. So you know, I was thinking like, OK, that at least recognizes that there is a history and that around the station was a very sizable and affluent African-American community and historically important. Um, that building was torn down <laughs> and we got a, you know, a reasonably okay modern building in instead, unlike what you guys got, you know, which is really terrible. So, and, <laughs> but the whole area around it was also torn down and so there's like no there there anymore, right? Except Gap stores. But I was thinking, okay, you got the plaque up and that's nice, does the right thing, is a token you know, to, to recognizing history and, and value. But that's just like the arrow pointing in the right direction. It's not actually taking steps to actually be much more proactive about what the African American community is or was back then, right? Just reading a plaque, right? So what if we uh, they invited artists? So what if we, in fact, invited architects, right? To actually make the space about that, right? So it actually becomes, right, you have to traverse some, some sort of spatial thing, right, in order to get to the trains to get through that memory. It'll never happen, right, because the bureaucratic world will never allow that. But we're, we're sort of self-limiting ourselves by always sort of uh, seeing architecture as just sort of the place where only you put a plaque on it, right? And I think we need to be much more aggressive in how we teach uh, architecture and how we understand space to sort of capture these things. So going on that point, and um, speaking as well, Jenny, you were talking about how people have to travel to Marfa, um, and that's part of the experience, the journey there. Uh, but Vinny, you were also talking about engagement and the way in which you speak with communities. And I think tying together Mark's most recent comment, um, I'm curious, when it comes to this idea of, of community interaction, it isn't enough to simply have the plaque. It isn't enough to simply say, you can visit this place. Um, and sometimes it isn't even enough to interpret in creative ways, even on digital platforms. Um, in what ways do you see monuments creating more interactive dialogues with communities in ways that really transcend uh, our, our, our tried and true methods of make sure it stands, make sure it stays, and instead thinking about monuments as a transformative agent 
for communities in really creating more engagement and resilience. I open up my house to hundreds of people a couple of times a year. Um, <clears throat> just had a party at the end of January. I'm doing a sculpture for Poughkeepsie of Sojourner Truth, and it turns out that Sojourner Truth's sixth generation grandson is a Facebook friend. <laughs> He's an artist, and evidently we were friends before I got the commission, so when I got the commission, he kind of came to the floor and wanted to know if he could come visit. And I said, I'm just starting. He says, I want to see it at the beginning. I'm like, but I'm just starting. He says, but I want to see it. I'm like, okay, come on. So he, I, so he comes, which was really cool. And, and I say to him, I'm going to give a party for you at the end. So I gave a party. And there's a couple of hundred people. And I do this, I've been doing this for like the last 10 years. Every year, I give at least one party where I literally let a couple of hundred people come through my house. Of course, I have to purge it for safety. But, you know, I give these giant parties and um, I think people really value it because they get to see the sculpture before it goes for castings. They actually get to kind of preview it. You know, I talk about it. And they get to wander around my house and look at artwork because I don't exhibit. I'm not a curatorial artist. I don't really do exhibitions unless I'm curating. So it's an opportunity for people to actually see the work for real rather than just seeing it you know, on their phones or on the screen. And, um, and people really seem to appreciate coming. You might want to know that Harriet Tubman's seventh generation niece calls me up upset because she wasn't invited to the party. I was like, I didn't know you. She's a Facebook friend too. I, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Well, why don't you come for lunch? So the, the following week, she comes for lunch. I think it's really interesting that really these iconic historical people's descendants are showing up at my house. <laughs> I, you know, it kind of blows me. And so, of course, um, it's interesting because even talking to them and asking them about how they feel about public art and how they feel about the stories of their ancestors being perpetuated and their role, because they're all kind of standing in the shadows like, you know, that's her, it's not me. It's like, yeah, but people want to know you, you know? And so, of course, you have social media, which is kind of cool, but there's nothing like walking into an artist's studio where there's a seven-foot sculpture that's going to go on the ground, and it's just the clay, and you can touch it, and you can ask questions and you can kind of be in the environment where the art is being created. People love that. You know, and again, the first time I did it, I realized that there was some value in doing that. I had to really steal myself to really let people come in my house and wander around and look at my stuff. You know, and so uh, I continue to do that regularly because I think there's value in that. I give these mega parties with lots of food and wine and you know, stuff out in the hallway. I live in a, a, an old trolley barn. Uh, that was renovated into live workspaces. So it's conducive to that. But, you know, I don't think I'm going to stop doing that because, again, because of the way people seem to respond to being able to do that, I see the value of doing it. Jenny, I know that you've had some interesting experiences in MARFA. And do you want to speak a little bit about the community engagement process there? Not only about the communities that travel to MARFA, but the community that lives there as well. Right, so we've been, Chinati has been a tremendous agent of change in that community. It's a town of 1,700 people, so it's a very, very small community. The next town is 32 miles over. Um, and in the 70s, when Judd came, the town was in serious economic decline because the military had left, the ranching industry had collapsed, and a lot of buildings were for sale. He was buying up buildings. There was a lot of skepticism. He was considered a hippie because he had long hair. And people weren't sure what he was doing because he had bagpipe music that was playing by the bonfire behind a big wall that he built. Um, but he became one of the largest employers at the time. Now it's the Border Patrol. And our community, because the world is coming through there now, um, the re gentrification happens in many places. There it's in a town of 1,700 people. So if you um, read the interviews or you see the documentaries that were filmed in the 90s, Judd was a savior and a hero. And there it was so exciting that this town was coming back to life. When you drive to Marfa, you drive through towns that didn't have that chance to come back to life. But the problem now is, 
with the world coming through there, you have people who are buying homes and the real estate market is, I mean, I moved to Marfa from Williamsburg, Brooklyn. The real estate market in Marfa is more cutthroat than Brooklyn. Like, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. um, for us, that means we need to be a very good neighbor. We are responsible for this. And now it's both the kind of savior and, and the devil. And we have to take that responsibility very seriously and try and be a good neighbor through employment and economic development in the town, but recognizing that now we do um, receive a lot of the blame. And that's my job to have open conversations with people about, yes, it saved the town, but it tremendously changed the town. And in our, I'll just give this example, you know, our school district, the public school in Marfa, Texas, 78% of the children in our school are at or below the poverty level. But because the real estate market is so extreme in Marfa, we classify it as a rich school district. So we send $500,000 a year back to Austin in our public school system. They don't look at the demographics, they look at the property values. Mm -hmm. So my other job, besides being a director at Chinati Foundation, is the head of the Marfa Education Foundation to make sure that our school has what it needs. And I need to do that because I am the director of the place that both saved the town, but now has really changed the town. Yeah. And I wasn't prepared for that when I took the job, <laughs> mm -hmm. but that's the responsibility that we, that's another kind of stewardship, you know, like being responsible for the things that are in the world that that either need to be preserved or that are such agents of change. Right, but I'm gonna argue that even the things that need to be preserved are agents of change. And Mark, you mentioned in your opening comments uh, the UNESCO World Heritage List, for example. And each time one of those monuments is designated, put on the list, it generally has a transformative effect on the community around it. Um, and to co-opt your fork in the road, <laughs> Mark, earlier, I'll say that as preservationists, um, indeed, every time we choose to interact, every time we choose to say this is worth preserving, this may not be worth preserving, this is something that we can adapt or use in different ways, we are at a fork in the road. We are making choices about what values and what stories we are trying to put forward to the next generation and, and even share with today's generation. Um, so I think we do have now questions from the audience that I want to uh, allow us to entertain. Oh, we have a lot. <laughs> OK, uh, so I have a question here. How do we determine what's worth preserving if it's not a commissioned work, but develops great public value? Read it again. <laughs> How do we determine what's worth preserving if it's not a commissioned work? but develops great public value. But I think that goes back to the community. I think right? that goes back to empowering people to be part of, I think, I think decisions get, there has been a bit of a dynamic of who, who's in the room making the decision and who's making the decision and giving the resources behind it. And so I think we are, are um, at least in my work and with your work, we're open to understanding the community engagement and that dialogue I think has been difficult certainly when we think about historical monuments that are are being taken down we need to, to we need to open ourselves up to that community discussion mm -hmm. I think the, the other thing is that every project needs a mother or a father and then it needs godparents so for instance, when I created the Enslaved Africans Rain Garden Initiative in 2009, um, I, had, I had, during that year, I had a historical symposium, I had community forums, I had at least three public events where people came to talk about why it mattered, what mattered, um, whether or not they cared, how much they cared, or whatever. And once I got a sense of how the community felt about it, then I proposed marriage to the city of Yonkers. And then, of course, the city of Yonkers was positive about it. Then I went to the Arts Council and asked them to be a godmother, because I did not have a 501c3, and I knew that I was going to have to find money some kind of how, and you, you need that to be able to offer people when they're giving money. So. 
Arts Westchester, um, which is the Arts Council for Westchester County, and it's the largest arts council in New York State, um, became the godmother for this project. And then ultimately, you know, I created a nonprofit to be able to do my own fundraising. But still, I'm the mother of that project, you know, and, and like a real mother, you know, when you have kids, it's 24 7 until the job is done. You know, godparents come through when they feel like it, they help when they feel like it, kind of like board members, you know. <laughs> Not to say that, you know, all board members are this way, but, you know, sometimes you have organizations and you have people who do all the work and then you have people who do none of the work. So um, I think whenever you have a project of any kind, you know, the big question is who cares, you know, um, who has the money, because you're always going to need money, some kind of how. You know, if you happen to have somebody in the community who cares that has deep pockets and just wants to shovel out money, nice. But a lot of times you've got to compete, which means the, the idea that the community has has to be valuable to the people who give the money. So, for instance, if you're talking about art, um, there's not a lot, a, lot, a lot of money for art, but there's a lot of money for history. There's a lot of money for history. So again, you know, the question is how you put together your initiative to create this monument, and then you have to figure out what's the best feature advantage and benefit to sell it, because that's what you're gonna have to do to make it happen. I'm gonna ask Mark, I'm gonna enlist Mark to help me translate some of this to architecture and the built environment. Um, because your comments earlier spoke to how uh, we have a lot of large monuments. We have um, things that are on the World Heritage List, for example, and that we need, in your words, a more s smaller monuments or community-driven monuments. Um, but in fact, when we look at the built environment, there are all sorts of smaller monuments all around. Vernacular architecture, and as a global historian, um, I'm... I'm curious whether you see a, a disparity or a bias in thinking about monuments as those big things and how we think about preservation in terms of some of the more vernacular or community valued places that don't have the same architecture with a capital A character or monumentality. Uh. Well, th yeah, there, there's a range, right? Um, unfortunately, you could sort of say that we go from, you know, buildings to plaques, right, very, very quickly. And, but all, there are a range of buildings that are part of our culture, right? And um, in the United States, we have a robust preservation world, so we have barns that are preserved and so forth and so on, right? Um, well, in Switzerland, um, but then on the other hand, you could say, well, what barns are being preserved and why, right? Well, they're preserved because they're disappearing, right? I drive to visit my, my mother uh, in Newport. I've been doing that every other week for the last five years, and it used to be all farmland, and there are at least 20 barns, right? Now, not a single one, right? So, you know, I mean, I can go somewhere and look at a barn museum or something, <laughs> but, you know, they're gone. So... Well, what, is, what does that mean? So, yes, change happens, and we have to sort of roll, roll with what we got and so forth. And I'm not saying, well, that barn should have been preserved or that barn preserved. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I mean, I basically I'm answering by saying well, I'm not less interested between the preserving vernaculars as places where things happen than maybe finding out what happened to the farmer who had to, who, who lived there for three generations and then had to sell it and then was sold to a service station, right? These are interesting stories themselves, right? So it's not to lament necessarily the, the destruction of the barn landscape, which is sort of sad, and the erasure of farming in the United States, but to hear that story and to ask then, as maybe not only as artists, but as architects, well, how would we build on that site, right? That might be differently. Of course, it would be in a way that maybe could be completely not for sale because no one would want to buy that thing, right? It may be half of a barn and half of a service station and some gas fumes coming up and... You know, you have to think completely Dadaistic, uh, crazy stuff, right? But maybe that's a way to sort of get us to open up. You know, we, we get so controlling when it comes to architecture, and I always look at my art friends and go, "Wow, that's so cool! Why can't we, <laughs> why can't we, you know, do that?" So that's where the story is, uh, you know, is. And so I think we preservation will always, once again, preserve 
the, the, the hard 1% of the story from somebody's past, right? The end, end game. But we don't see the richness of it you know, at, at all. So that's what I'm sort of saying. We need to figure out ways to sort of expose that, bring that forth. Um, maybe it's site specific or maybe it's not, you know? Um, architecture has a great way of transporting itself to other places because it's, you know, a barn here, a barn there, right? So genericness could be, you know, put into play as well. I'm gonna do one last question from the audience. Uh, is there an important educational purpose in preserving the monuments of our ancestors, even if our values today are different? Absolutely. Uh, I think that the interesting thing about art in public places is that you can learn about history really quickly. It's, you don't, it's not like having to read a book or going to see a movie. Um, you can just go to a public place and see an installation of some sort and come away a few minutes later and know a whole lot more than you did when you walked up on it. So yeah, I think there is great value um, as an educational tool. But again, uh, I think it's important to be mindful of where these monuments are ultimately installed. I mean, for us, our mission is so specific because it's what the artists wanted. You know, we're, this is a museum built by an artist because he wanted that duration. He wanted that commitment. Institutions weren't giving it to his work or the work of his peers that he thought were among the best of his time, our time. I mean, he wrote somewhere a portion of contemporary art has to exist for the art of this time and place. And so that's long-term thinking. So it, it's, it's a commitment to something that has a specificity, but I believe he clearly hoped would live forward in time. And I think what we're experiencing, just to visitor numbers, and growing visitor numbers has never been part of my priority as a director, and yet 30% annually is increasing. I think what's interesting about the experience at Chinati is that it's more relevant, and it seems to be, it feels to be more relevant and resonant now than when an artist did something so radical like leave New York purchase a former military base and install large-scale large scale sculptures. But for those, and what's been also interesting in terms of, of, of kind of how these things live forward and for whom, some of the artists there wanted their work to deteriorate over time and decay, but then they realized, no, that was actually happening too fast. So let's arrest it in its decay so that it's permanent, but it feels like it's changed. I mean, that's such a crazy conservation arc conservator, oh my god. Um, that's such a bizarre thing to have something be fixed in its state of decay. So, um, I mean, I think the artists that we are beholden to, because we follow where they lead, wanted this to be in perpetuity. Um, I like the, I'm intrigued by, and I also like the word ancestors, another word you hear a lot uh, today. Um, the, the, I mean, if we take it really, I mean, I'm, you know, in a way seriously and not just like uh, whatever ancestors, right? Uh, a lot of the world uh, included ancestors in the conversation. It was really only uh, much of the modern world that sort of forgot ancestors. So the Incas, uh, everything the Incas did was in relationship to ancestors, and they were the mountain. And when the Incas would take a piece of the mountain to quarry, what we call quarry, they would have to ask the mountain ancestors permission to do that. And the, the, the rock, what we call rock and a mineral in Inca language is flesh. So they take a piece of the flesh of the ancestor. Right? And that's why the Inca stones look like flesh things, right? <clears throat> and so they're not taking minerals, right? They're, they're taking a chunk of your flesh, ouch, right? And then dragging it 500 miles, right, to make the temple. <clears throat> so when they rebuild the temple, they're rebuilding it from flesh bits, right? Now, we, of course, go, you've got to be kidding me, right? It's, oh, I know. If, if that stone falls out, I'm just going to take the next stone and put it back up. Well, that's not how the Incas did it, right? The Incas asked permission to do this, right? They asked their ancestors, right? Today, we don't do that. We have the contractor come and build brick walls and stone walls and, you know, comes from God knows where, right? So ancestrality is really significant, and I think that's something we've really lost um, in how to speak you know, to our ancestors, right? It doesn't mean it... Uh, you know, they'd have, I mean, they still extracted the good. <laughs> it's not like they said, oh, the mountain is sacred, we can't touch it. No, the mountain is sacred, but we're going to take some flesh, right? 
but we're going to feed you the proper way, and we're going to say you know, the proper thing. So ancestrality is something maybe we could think about again. Okay. Well, I want to thank all three of our panelists for, for being here with us this evening um, and for provoking us to think about monuments not only as things to save, but as things that are continually undergoing creation and part of a transformative process. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Now it works. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Vini, Mark, Jenny, and Erica, for uh, such uh, an inspiring conversation. Uh, I feel it's just a beginning, because at One Monument Fund, we want to keep questioning this notion of monuments. What are they? For whom? For what? Uh, because as you said many times, we believe in the transformative power of monuments. That's why we do what we do. Uh, we want through cultural heritage by protecting it to create a better world, uh, more cohesive, more respectful, more beautiful, and more meaningful. So thank you all of us for joining us. Uh, if you want to learn more about our activities or the upcoming public programs, you can go on wmf.org. And I thank again the Museum of the City of New York and Whitney especially uh, for welcoming us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.